back to our study in demonology. Tonight's going to be one of those horrid nights. Why is it going to be horrid? Because I have to deal with a passage that I can't explain very well. So that is going to be, it, it, is, it is green on here. Oh, why'd you hear the grumbling in my stomach? That could be quite embarrassing because I'm still kind of hungry. So I hope, hope it, I hope it attracted my mouth. Sorry about that if you did not hear me. Um, it seems like the microphone fell when I was playing the guitar. I got to look out for that. Sorry about that. All right. So I'm going to be dealing with a passage that is a very difficult passage to talk about, and I don't have all the answers for you. So I may come across looking ignorant, though I trust me, I did study the passage. But we're looking at demonology. And what is demonology about? Well, it's the study of demons. And again, caution yourself. Whenever someone studies demonology, it can lead or it can pique your interest in the occult, O-C-C-U-L-T. And you have to not allow that to happen. Uh, what you have to do is just realize that the Bible teaches us about the spiritual realm. It gives us a little bit of, of insight and pictures of the spiritual realm. But the Bible forbids us from getting involved with demonic activity, involved in things that promote demonic activity, and uh, it does not want us involved in any of those things. So all we have to focus on, even though we're studying demonology, it is a topic taught in the Word of God, we need to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the number one thing, and that's why I want to start off with a great song saying, what a friend we have in Jesus. Because if you don't have Jesus as your friend, these, can, these creatures, these spiritual beings, can have free reign in your life. At least as a Christian, we are protected from everything ever being possessed, all right? You can never be possessed by a demon if you are a Christian. In order to be possessed by a demon, that would mean that the demon would have to bind the Holy Spirit of God to be able to enter into you. The Holy Spirit of God is not going to enter, uh, is not going to leave us nor forsake us, so demons cannot possess a true born-again believer, but they can possess individuals and who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they can oppress Christians, meaning they can do things in your life to put oppression in your life, especially if you are dealing with the occult, if you are doing things you ought not to do. Last week, uh, we talked about the different ways that they are defined in the Word of God, and they are defined as spirits. They are defined as unclean spirits. Now again, not all diseases are caused by demons, but some demons can cause diseases in people's lives. We see that they are called evil spirits. As an evil spirit, they have the intent on doing evil. They can become very vicious. We looked at that. We saw them called the seducing spirits. And as seducing spirits, they are going to promote false doctrines and confusion in the world. That is basically their job. So those are the three categories of demons that we looked at last week. We're going to look at the fourth one, which is the one that calls in the word of God a familiar spirit. Now, what's a familiar spirit? Well, familiar spirits are those that are used during things such as seances, those that deal with people that are channeling. Those, what do I mean by channeling? There's people that will uh, go into a trance, and sometimes they'll write a book, or they'll go into a trance, and they'll write stuff really quick, and they have prophecies with that. There's a familiar spirit that they deal with. There are those that deal with Ouija boards. Each Ouija board seems to be attached to a certain familiar spirit and then you conjure that up i know it's promoted as a child's game but it is not a child's game it is wicked and it's of the occult it's satanic in nature and demonic in its way now, i know perhaps you probably did it and you made the thing move and stuff like that and and all that kind of stuff for the silly ouija board but that stuff is an actuality stay away from those things uh, familiar spirits will deal with astrology reading the signs in the sky and things like that uh, the 1-800 psychic lines and tell your fortunes those all deal with familiar spirits familiar spirits are those things where a person proclaims to be able to communicate with the dead so a person claims that they have someone from the dead that gives them information about the dead or information about those things. You'll see in the Bible, those are either called necromancers or they are called wizards or they are called diviners. They are those that are, have a familiar, they are a human being that has allowed themselves to come in contact with a demonic realm and has opened themselves up to that demonic realm. And therefore, that's why it's called a familiar spirit. We have an illustration of this. Again, this is one of those that is hard to talk about. But let's go to 1 Samuel chapter number 28. 1 Samuel 28. We have Saul already told. He's King Saul right now. 
He has already been told that David was going to get the kingdom, that the kingdom was rent away from him. He's getting attacked by the Philistines, and he has no, he has no, no, doesn't know what to do because his kingdom is falling apart all around him, and he knows that David is winning victories, and David is getting exalted, so he decides to do something that he knows he ought not to do. He decides to do something that is against the word of God, and it gives us a slight picture into what familiar spirits are about. In 1 Samuel chapter number 28, starting in verse number 3, the word of God says, now Samuel was dead. You know who Samuel was, right? Samuel was the final judge. He was the last prophet so far. He's the one that anointed Saul. He's the one that God used to take, uh, to rip the kingdom away from Saul. Samuel was a very prominent man in the word of God in the first 28 chapters of 1 Samuel. All right, he anointed David, he anointed Saul, all these things. He was a spokesperson of God. Well, he's dead now, all right? So Saul has no one to talk to because he's been living wickedly, and he has no one to talk to right now. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. The wizards, of course, are those that can communicate with the dead. That's what it is. You're going to see these are also going to be called necromancers. The difference between the two is one knows a spirit that they have, constantly communicates with the same evil spirit, and the other one tries to reach the spiritual realm and opens themselves up to any spiritual influence. That's the difference between the two. But it's basically the same thing. They're trying to reach out to the dead. Okay. Verse number four. So Saul did what the word of God said when he first became king. When he got into the land, he, when he first became king, he kicked out everyone that had familiar spirits in there. Anyone that practiced this demonology, anyone that practiced this type of occult thing, he followed what the word of God said and kicks them out. So that's what it's laying the foundation for. Verse number four, and the Philistines, that's their major superpower enemy at this time against Israel. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. Now, what is this Urim thing? Well, back then, the high priest was given a special garment that had the Urim and Thurim on it, and the 12 stones of Israel. It was a really beautiful thing that they had. And somehow, the Bible does not go into detail, and I don't know how it worked. But somehow, God would communicate, because only the high priest was allowed to wear the Urim and the Thurim. And so when they had to decide the will of God, they would talk to the high priest, and somehow the high priest would get the information through this garment that they were wearing. I don't know if it was different colors. I don't know if one lit up. I don't, the Bible doesn't say, I don't know if one shot. I don't know what it did. But somehow, they would be able to get communication. Somehow, God would communicate with the, with the high priest with this. But because Saul is not living right, God said... I am not going to do anything for you. I am not going to communicate to you in any way. Remember, the word of God wasn't in full completion yet. So at this time, God would communicate in dreams. God would communicate in visions. God would communicate by the prophets. But since they don't have that now, or we don't have that now, but Saul was seeking the Lord, saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do? But God already told him, because you disobeyed me, because you you you." You did that which is wrong because you are doing wicked things and you are trying to kill David rather than set him up. I'm ripping that kingdom away. So don't talk to me. I'm not going to answer your prayers. So God was silent when it came to this King Saul. Verse number seven, then said Saul unto his servants, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said unto him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Isn't that interesting? Endor is still part of Saul's kingdom. Saul has already, at the very beginning of his life, at the beginning of his ministry given to God as a king, kicked out all of them that did familiar spirits and everything else. Now he's in trouble. God's not listening to him. God's not answering the way he wants him to answer. So where does, God, where does Saul turn to? He doesn't turn to himself and say, I need to repent. I need to get right with God. I need to do something because God is not answering my prayers or communicating with me. He doesn't look to himself. Instead, he looks to the occult. 
Instead, he looks to Satan's side. Instead, he looks to the demons. And he says, what I want you, my men, to do is seek out in the country and find a woman that has a familiar spirit. One that communicates with, we're going to find out, usually demons. That's what they communicate with. That one that communicates with a demon, one that communicates with the spiritual realm, find a lady like that. And it wasn't long, his servants were able to find one. So that kind of says what type of society the Saul was in. But look what Saul does in verse number 8. And Saul, that's King Saul, disguised himself and put on other raiment. So he didn't go dressed as the king anymore. Raiment just means clothing. And he went and two men with him and they came to the woman by night. Why they do it at night? Well, they did it at night because that's usually when evil things take place. You don't do evil things in the middle of the day because you might get caught. Right? So you do things at night. So he puts on, he disguises himself, takes two men with him, and he comes to the woman. And he came by night. And he said, I pray thee. The word pray means like to beg. She's, he's not praying to her. I beg thee. I, I'm pleading with thee. Divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. There's your typical seance that they said. There's the idea that you can go to some weird witch lady, some weird warlock man, or whatever it is, you can sit down at a table, and this individual usually says, give me something of that person, or, or they try and do something, and then they try to go into a trance to connect to the spirit world, and usually that spirit world will go through them, and then they will either speak like the individual, or they will do things like the individual uh, that they're trying to look for, and then people get all duped because they think, oh, that's my aunt, Gran that's my grandma from the grave, and she's speaking to me because only she would have known that information about me, and, and all that kind of stuff. There's only two reasons why they would know that information about your grandma. Two, two reasons why. The first one is, is 100% hoax. And what I mean by 100% hoax is, from what I've read in my study on these individuals, is that these psychics, these tarot people, these weirdo, these astrology, these occultist people will know that they have a, a, an appointment with you in advance. Guess what they do? They go online. You know how much information about you is online? Things that you don't even remember that you posted or talked about or said through your Instagrams, through your Twitches, through your Facebooks, through all your social media. You probably don't even remember half the things. I bet a number of us get shocked. I do sometimes. I don't even, I'm not even on Facebook that, that often. But every once in a while it says, oh, this happened a year ago. And it shows all these pictures. I'm like, oh, I can't even know I had these pictures. You know, and it shows you all that stuff. And you think about, I didn't even know that was on the internet. It's out there. They have it. There's so much information. So they will do research and they'll try to find something about you that you kind of talked about before that was important to you. So when you come to the science, they say, oh, your grandma wants to say she remembers when she brushed your hair and made you cry. <gasps> oh, that's my grandma. It's her. And then they go on and tell them all kinds of things, whatever they want to hear, as long as they keep getting their money in their pocket. So there is, there is a large portion, and there are big hoax. There are a bunch of hoaxers that use the spiritual realm for that idea. But there are those that actually communicate with the spiritual realm. And those that are communicating with the spiritual realm are not with literal dead people. He, it is not your grandma that's coming back from the grave. Matter of fact, the Word of God has said that once you die, that is it. There is no coming back. So if you've seen a vision of your mom or your dad or someone else or someone close to you and you saw that vision, you said, oh my, she's dead, but she appeared to me like three weeks afterwards. That is not your grandma. That is not your loved one. That is not your father. It is not. The word of God says that once they are done, they are done. They cannot come back to this realm. It's impossible for them to do that, right? Right? So what is this that these other ones are communicating with in the outer realm? That, are, that is what demonology is about. That's why God said, stay away from them that know familiar spirits. These are special demons. And guess what? Demons don't die. Demons have been around since the creation of the world. Demons know about your families. Demons know about what happened to good old grandma when things were going on to be able to bring something up to you. Demons can masquerade as angels of light. Demons can masquerade at all kinds of things. I have a special series on a UFO because someone asked me about that. And they're like, Pastor, what about UFOs? It's, 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 it's coordinated demonology. I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to take a day and just go through some of the UFO things because I just read in the paper again today that 
man, the credibility. The Navy's out there, and they saw 100 UFOs. There, we got to be getting invaded from other places. There's got to be aliens out there. What are those? I got a special lesson on that, so we'll cover that later. But the whole idea is this, that this familiar spirit is a demon that this one individual has allowed themselves to either be possessed by or to have contact with. All that stuff is real and viable today. Some of it, they make it out to be a game. They'll have TV shows. There's a bunch of hoaxes with it. There's a bunch of fraudulent things to try and make you let your guard down. But there is a segment of that group of the true occult that does allow demonic activity. This lady whom they went to, Saul knows or the people know that she has a familiar spirit. She has one that is working in the spiritual realm. She is basically has a demon as a spirit friend is basically what this is. And so this is what's going on. I pray thee divine unto me by the familiar spirit. In verse number eight, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Again, the wizards are the ones that don't have a familiar spirit, but they open themselves up to the demonic realm. All right. So they don't, they still deal with spiritual things in the negative sense, but they don't have one specific spirit that they work with, all right, one specific demon. And so the spirits and the wizards out of the land, wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? So she's basically, she doesn't trust Saul. Whether she knows it's Saul or not, I don't know. But she does not trust Saul and thinks that he's laying a trap so that she does her divination, the familiar spirit comes, and then Saul and his two guys drag her out of the country. That's what she's thinking, all right, that she's being set up to do her thing. Verse number 10, and Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, as the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. That's quite curious, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I wonder how many other people try to justify their ungodly actions by bringing the Lord into it. Mm -hmm. Almost blaming the Lord. Saying, well, look, I promise you, I'm not, by the, as the Lord lives, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is the covenant name of God and the word of God, that I promise you, as the covenant God lives, I will not cut you off. Now, really dumb thing for him to say there, but even worse, I think, is this lady that has a familiar spirit. Why would she even believe him? I mean, she knows he's getting ready to do something in the occult. She knows she wants him to act into the demonic realm, and yet she takes his promise from the Lord that he's going to live. All, see, this whole section here does not make sense to me at all how it works out. But I guess as confusion goes and things happen, this is what goes on. Verse number 11, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel! So this lady's going to go into her deal, and this is how it was supposed to work. How it's supposed to work is this lady's supposed to go into her seance or channeling or whatever it is. And she's supposed to talk to her familiar spirit, the demonic, the demonic spirit, the demon. And that demon is supposed to act like Samuel. That demon is supposed to give information as if he were Samuel. It is all a hoax in the demonic realm that this spirit, this one spirit that she has, is going to pretend to be whoever that person wants them to be. That is, that's the trick that's going on here. That's what's supposed to happen. But look what God does. God totally intervenes and does something that I don't think has ever happened again. Verse number 12. And when the woman saw Samuel, what did she do? She cried with a loud voice. What happened? It wasn't her demonic spirit that she normally has show up for her that tricks people. This actually was Samuel. This was actually the prophet Samuel. God, for whatever reason, allowed the prophet Samuel to have this interaction. And this lady, when she actually saw from the dead that it is Samuel, she screamed because it wasn't her demon friend that she normally would have. It was actually Samuel. She cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou, de Why hast thou deceived me, for thou art Saul? Well, she knows something's up. She knows something wrong because 
Why would, it, why would the actual dead person appear <laughs> to me? Something's up. You really are Saul. I don't know if Samuel told her or because of what transpired that really Samuel showed up that she's like, you got to be Saul. Maybe she had it in the back of her mind. That's why she was like a little, I don't know if you're trying to catch me, but whatever it was, no, you lied to me. You deceived me. You actually are Saul. Verse number 13. And the king said unto her, be not afraid. For what sawest thou? So I'm going to keep my word. I'm not going to kill you. I have some business I got to do. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Now what does that mean? Well, it's kind of interesting. That word gods there, you can see it's a small g, small o, small d, small s. That is actually the Hebrew word Elohim. We know God, his name is El. El means God. Elohim is the plural. And when we're talking about the God of the Bible, because he is God the Father, one God, but manifested in three persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and because he is the Almighty Majesty, his name is pluralized. So it'll say, and God created the heavens and the earth. But the word God there is Elohim. It's the plural word for God. So this is interesting. Because this woman, as she sees, she's saying, I'm seeing gods. She's not claiming to be the God of the Bible, so it's not the capital G, capital O, capital D. But she's saying she sees gods. Now, what does the word gods literally mean? It literally means the mighty ones. When it's in this context, in Hebrew, it does seem that it would lend to the idea of spirits. That she actually saw spirits coming out of the earth. Now, why would they be coming out of the earth? I thought that if a Christian died or someone that believed in God died, remember we did personal eschatology already, I thought that they went to this place called Hades. This is before Jesus Christ rose from the dead, so they had to be in this place called Hades. It almost sounds as if that Hades is in the center of the earth or if Hades is somewhere in the earth so that when Samuel raised, he came up out of the earth. It's kind of like what it sounds like. That is 100% speculation. I don't know where Hades is at. I don't know why God chose to do this. I don't know why this portion of the word of God is so confusing to me. But whatever it is, she saw when she was in her little seance room, however she did that, she was actually to see spirits coming out of the ground, and one of them ended up being Samuel. Literally, Samuel from the grave. Again, don't ask me to explain it. It's, this is the one-time thing. This is the only time this has ever happened. I, I, it just, I, I can't explain it. Why did he come out of the earth? I don't know. That's just the way God chose to do it. I, I, I can't draw a whole bunch of theology from this, but this is exactly what the Word of God says. She said, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, what form is he of? What form are these spirits of? And she said, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. Now, let's stop there. Does this show that there is age when we die? So if I die an old man, are you going to see me as an old man coming back from the dead? Am I going to be wearing the same clothes that I'm wearing today? I'm going to be wearing a prophet's mantle on me? That's why this passage is confusing. <laughs> How did this take place? Why was Samuel still looking old? And why did Samuel wear a mantle? I can't answer. Like I said, I've told you, I'm not going to be smart this time around. I don't know why. The only thing I can see is that God chose this interaction for this specific purpose, allowed it to happen one time, and allowed Samuel to appear in the way that Saul would 100% recognize that it was Samuel. That's the only thing I can think of. Other than that, I have no clue what is actually going on in this passage. I could speculate a whole bunch, but I'm trying to stay away from all that speculation which a lot of people, unfortunately, do when they come to this passage. So he says, it's Saul. I mean, it's Samuel. Uh, back to verse 14. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Oh, he's so humble now. Oh, now he's, he's Mr. I'm going to obey the prophet, what the prophet has to say. He didn't obey the prophet while the prophet was living. But now, all of a sudden, he wants to fall down like he's going to change the prophet's mind. Well, look. If God is not speaking to you, Saul, do you think that Samuel, God's prophet, whether living or dead, is going to speak to you? No, he's not. not at least not kindly, anyway. And that's exactly what happens here. 
And this is interesting. Look what Samuel says to him. Verse 15. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? Disquieted means cause anxiety. Cause me to be stressed out. Cause me to stop relaxing. It seems that he was enjoying his time away from this earth. And now Samuel call, or Saul calls him up and God allows that situation. And now he's mad. Why'd you disquiet me? Why'd you bring me back here? I don't want to be back to this place. I'm kind of comforted by that. Because once I'm gone, I am thinking I don't want to come back. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. And it seems that I am verified here with Samuel. Why you disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, Oh, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Well, guess what, Saul? That's what got you in the problems in the first place. God told you that obedience is better than sacrifice. Remember, because God told Saul, he said, when you go kill those kings over there, you destroy everything, all their possessions. Take nothing. Kill the kings. Kill the people. Kill all their animals. This is my judgment on them. And what did Saul do? He kept the king alive, and he kept the best animals alive. And so Samuel, if you remember way back when, comes walking up, and he sees Saul in all his glory saying, look, praise the Lord. Let, let God get all the glory. We did it. And Samuel said, then what's all this bleeding of the sheep I hear? What are you doing? And then Saul, of course, like a true man that he is, said, well, you know, the people wanted it. It wasn't me. It was the people that did it. And I had to listen to them because I was afraid of them. And then that's when Samuel said, you know, Saul, it's better to obey God than to sacrifice. Oh, yeah, I got all these great things. I'll sacrifice all this for God, but I'm going to live in disobedience doesn't work that way. God wants you to live in obedience to him. And so Saul does the same thing here. God's not speaking to me. Samuel, you took so long to get here. That's what he just said with the king of Agag. You took so long, I didn't know what to do. So we just went and fought and I kept all this stuff. Same thing's happening. Philistines are coming. God's not answering me like I want him to right now. So what am I going to do? Well, I'll turn to the occult. I'll disobey God and think that I can go on serving God. Crazy what he did here. He's stressed out. Verse 16, then Samuel, then said Samuel, wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and has become thine enemy? What are you asking me for? If you're already in disfavor with God, you think you're going to be in favor with me, Samuel's saying? I'm his prophet. I'm his spokesperson. I'm the one that chewed you off to begin with. I told you it was better to obey than, than to have sacrifice. So you actually think that because God's not answering you, that I'm going to answer you? What's wrong with you? You're, you're, you're not right in the head here, buddy. Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. He says, I'm sorry you don't like living with the consequences of your sin. But guess what? You're going to. What you're going through right now, though you hate it, he's telling him. Though you think God's not answering your prayers. Though you think God's not answering through, your, through the dreams and the prophets and everything else. It's because you brought that on yourself. And you think, I'm going to change it? You think, I'm going to re relieve it somehow? You're crazy. Remember when you disobeyed. Stop blaming the Lord. Don't blame me. Don't blame the people. Remember when you disobeyed. Remember when you went against God what told you to do. That's what you are getting. Yeah, you may have said sorry, and yeah, you may have had this false repentance, but guess what? You still got to live with the consequences of your action, and your kingdom right now, right before your face, is getting rent from you. It's getting taken from you, and it's being ripped off, and it's given right here to David. You're living through what God said was going to happen. Verse 19, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines. You lost, son. And tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. You're going to be dead tomorrow, Saul. I'm sure you didn't want to hear that. 
but you want the truth, you want to know what's going on, you're going to be dead. And not only you, your posterity is going to be dead. Your two sons are going to die and they will be with me. Now, whether the with me there means with me in paradise or means with me in the grave, right? So people use this to say that Saul was a believer because Samuel said he's going to be with him when he dies and the sons are going to be with him when he dies. It might, it might not. It could just be meaning you're going to die and you're going to be with me in the spiritual realm, right? That's what it could mean. Or it could mean you could be there. I'm not going to fight one way or the other. Verse number 20, then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him for he had eaten no bread all the day, nor all the night. And the woman came unto Saul and saw that he was sore troubled and said unto him, Behold, thine handmaid hath obeyed thy voice, and I have put my life in my hand, and have hearkened unto thy words, which thou spakest unto me. Now therefore I pray, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat, that thou mayest have strength when thou goest on thy way. I want you out of here, and I'm going to feed you so you're strong enough to get out. But he refused, and said, I will not eat. But his servants together with the woman compelled him and he hearkened unto their voice. So he arose from the earth and sat upon the bed. And the woman had a fat calf in the house and she hasted and killed it and took flour and kneaded it and did bake unleavened bread thereof. And she brought it before Saul and before his servants and they did eat. Then they arose and went out, went away that night. So not only did Saul think he was only going to spend a little bit of time to get information from the occult, after a little bit, what actually happened? He's sitting down having fellowship yeah. with the occult. It dragged him in even further with this lady of the familiar spirits. That's what we got to be careful of. The word of God is very clear that this kind of stuff is condemned. I'll end with this. Go to Deuteronomy chapter number 18. This is where Saul got the idea of staying away from it. But what I want you to do is kind of look at this and I want you to evaluate your life. And I want you to see that if you are involved in the occult at all. I have heard of Christians getting involved in different things or allowing different things in their lives. Look what the Word of God says in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. God says this in verse 9. He says, When thou, speaking of the nation of Israel, Israel, are come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So we should not be piqued into the curiosity of going after the occult. God said that is a danger, right? So when you get into that land, don't even learn about it. Don't get involved with it. Don't say, you know what, pastor? I'm really interested about this study. I want to see how wicked it really is. I'm going to go study up on this. No, stay away from it. Stay away from it. You, you already know enough. You'll know enough after tonight to stay away from any of these things. Because God says to stay away from them. He says, verse number 10, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. What does it mean to pass through the fire? Pass through the fire is basically child sacrifice. Passing through the fire was offering one of your children to the god Moloch. And Moloch had a dedication time during the temple feast with the prostitutes. And what they would end up doing is taking this baby, and there's two forms of passing through the fire. The one passing through the fire was a ritual where you would have this Moloch god holding a brass plate, and the fire would cook underneath it, and you would lay your firstborn on that fire and allow it to be sacrificed and burnt for the blessings of Moloch. Then there was another one where there was a ring of fire that this god Moloch would hold. And if you would take your baby and pass through there, then you would have favor with the temple, which was filled with sodomites and prostitutes. And that would give you the rite of passage to enter into that temple and be in favor with them. It's like a symbolically of giving your child over to this individual. That's the two ways that you could pass a, a child through fire. He says, you're not going to do that. Do not pass your son or your daughter to pass them through the fire. Or that uses divination. Divination is, of course, witchcraft. Those are those that study spells, those that study 
um, uh, curses, those that study blessings, and the idea of that if I do this certain type of thing, if I say these certain type of words, I'm going to be blessed, or if I say these certain words on you, you are going to be cursed, or I could cast some spell of love or something like that to get someone to like me and all that kind of stuff. That's what divination means. Or an observer of times. Observer of times means the astrology. Those are the ones that read if you're a Sagittarius or you're a PCs or whatever else you are. I just know I'm a Sagittarius when I was young. I don't, I, I don't read those things. I don't read those things. It's the same idea of the Chinese noodle, uh, thing, Chinese noodles. No, not Chinese noodles. Those, those Chinese uh, uh, year of the dragon and stuff, the year you were born, and it tells you that you're going to be this way or that way. You know, if you're a Sagittarius, then uh, this is what's going to happen when the stars are aligned this way. You are this type of person or that type of person, all that kind of garbage. That's the observation of astrology. Uh, that's what it means, observer of times. The next one says, or an enchanter. An enchanter is someone that reads signs or omens. These would be the ones that cast tarot cards. These would be your fortune tellers. That'd be the I Ching, where they throw the pennies down and read the pennies. These would be your palm readers. Anyone that reads signs or omen, omens would be considered an enchanter. And then it says, or a witch. A witch here means a conjurer. This is someone that would use hallucinogens. This is someone that would use sorcery, which sorcery means pharmakeia, which is in Greek anyway, which means the idea of drugs. It's inducing people to hallucinogenic ideas uh, and putting them into that way. That's what a witch or a uh, sorcerer would be in this area. Verse number 11, or a charmer. A charmer is someone that we would consider as a hypnotist. I know there's Christians that say, oh, I'm going to go to a hypnotist. The word of God forbids it. Don't do it. Don't go around the hypnotisms. You know why? Because when you are a hypnotist, you are giving your will to somebody else. You are opening yourself up. You are not sober. You are not on your right mind. You are not alert to what's going on for you or to you. That would be a charmer in the word of God is a hypnotist. Or a consulter. What's a consulter? The consulter is one we studied tonight. That's an idea of being the seances. Someone that says that they, you talk to them and you want to learn about the future. You talk to them and get divine revelation. You talk to them and they'll tell you something that God hasn't revealed to you, but they'll be the ones to give it to you. That's the idea of a consulter. Then it says, stay away from those with familiar spirits. We've already talked about that. Those that have one specific spirit that they're able to talk to the demonic realm with or with a wizard that is a soothsayer that has a familiar spirit or the one looking for a familiar spirit or a necromancer a necromancer means someone that reaches out for the dead these are people that see the dead these are the ones that meet people of the dead these are the ones that try to, to tell you that they have communication with people that have already passed on god says stay away from them and what they do. Verse number 12. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Notice the Lord recognizes that these things are real. It's not fake. It's not phony. This is truly demonic things. And God recognizes that they are real. And he tells you stay away from them. Because they are an abomination to him. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. You want to know what the future is for your life? Study the word of God and live your life right. You don't, go to, you don't go to some consultant. You don't go to some thing. You don't need to have some prophet up here telling you, oh, thus saith the Lord that this is going to happen. Why do you need that when you got the word of God? Right. And by, by the way, what's the difference between a satanic diviner and supposedly a God-ordained diviner today? What would be the difference? How do you know the difference? Well, unfortunately, I did some study on that because I... There's a very famous pastor out there that's preaching. He should not be in the pulpit. He should not do anything. He was very prominent in the President Trump campaign. He was doing all kinds of things. He's a very prominent fellow that's out there. And I was watching him. And guess what happened? He got up at his pulpit and he talked about an exorcism that he did. And that he was able to talk to a demon. And these de this demon was able to tell him about six witches that are in his church. He gave him the first name and the last name and the address, and he knows those witches in the church, and they better get out before he kicks them out and does all this kind of ranting and raving and all this hysterics. 
what ran through my mind is, why would a demon give you that information to begin with? What are you doing communicating with a demon? So how do I know what he just said is divine revelation from God, that that's how we're supposed to handle with demons? Because he thinks he's right. But then there's someone else, the lady that he, kicked, that he kicked out of the church, she gave her side of the story. And she's another one that believes in prophecies, that she's able to speak the word of God. And she said, no, what happened that night? The pastor came over to my house. I've been with him for seven months. He, and my, he came over to visit my family. We've been his bodyguards for the past five months, my husband and I. So we just had him over. And so I was going to speak a divine word on him. And so I asked God to give me a divine word. And he took me over to, to Judges chapter 7, verse number 20. And I put them in a little jar. And that was for me to tell him, God spoke to me, that the prophecy I were to give him, the divine revelation, I was give him that he was going to get rid of he needed to get rid of people on his staff so that his light could shine brighter judges chapter 7 verse 20 talks about breaking the lamps and the, and the light of getting to show brighter and so she interpreted that her word of God that she got was to give it to this individual this pastor because she loves him and this is spoken by God he says that's from the devil she says that's from God how do we know what's right how do we know who's right and who's wrong I'll tell you what, they're both wrong. Because God doesn't use consulters today. He uses, thus saith the Lord, the revealed word of God. This is all you need is the word of God. Don't go to consulters whether they claim to be Christian or not. Don't listen to people that say, you know, God has a special message from me to you. Say, you know what? Let them tell me. I'll find it through the word of God. I'll be fine. You want to know what the end of the world is going to be like? You want to know what the future is going to be? Read the Bible. This is what God wants you to know. Am I going to have a child or not? No one can tell you that. Oh, but my auntie from the grave came back and said that I needed to do this. And I know that I'm right with God because I did this now. That auntie from the grave was a demon. That's what it is. They don't come back. But pastor, I saw blank, blank, blank. I know what I saw. I had this experience. I can only say this. If your experience does not line up with the word of God, it's not from God. Just keep that in mind. Pastor, you can't tell me that I didn't see, actually see my whatever, auntie. You can believe what you want to believe. I know what the word of God reveals. And if you are seeing those things, you're involved in the occult one way or the other. I guarantee it. Because people that are not involved in the occult do not see those things. Same thing with UFOs. Do a study on it. The people that actually see the UFOs over and over again and claim to be abducted, look at the case studies on them. I'm getting into my UFO study. Look at the case studies on them. 100% of the time, 100% of the time, they're involved in the occult. 100% of the time. We'll talk about UFOs next week. Maybe. I don't know if I want to do that or not. I'll still pray about doing that or not. If I don't talk about UFOs, then what we're going to do is we're going to look at how demons affect human beings. And unfortunately, that's going to be a, kind of a rough study too because when you look at it and you look at our society, you will see the strong demonic influences on human beings and what demons can do for human beings. But like I said, to begin with, number one, hopefully this doesn't scare you. Hopefully it doesn't intimidate you. Hopefully it's a great warning to say, I better get this occult stuff out of my life and I want to honor the Lord in everything I do and do it. Because Jesus Christ has already won the victory. These, like, like we saw before, Jesus Christ is the one that they bow down to. They have to submit to him. He's already won the victory. We have a friend in Jesus Christ. Greater is he that is in you than is in this world. He has not given you the spirit of fear or to, to go back to bondage, but he's given you the spirit of power and of a sound mind and of love. He's given you those things. So don't be afraid of the demons, but don't go seeking them out. Let them seek you out because you're living for the Lord. Then you're guaranteed the Lord's protection and through it all. You start seeking this stuff out, you do just like Saul does. You get yourself out of that umbrella of God's protection and God is under no obligation to protect you if you don't want to obey him. If you want to live outside that umbrella, it's up to you. So I'd rather leave on a good note. Keep your faith in Christ. Keep looking to Jesus Christ. Live for him. Let the demons do their do. Let the confusion come. You just live for God, and we'll see how that works out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the word of God. We thank you for these lessons that you've given to us.
And Father, sometimes these are shocking. There, I know many people have seen visions or seen weird things or heard stuff or whatever and thought it to be a loved one from the grave or even you appearing to them or different things like that. But Lord, you said that that's not going to take place, that we just are to stay away from anything that consults from the dead. That, that has nothing to do with it. We do see you use that as an illustration to, to Samuel in a, in a one-time situation. They're never to be repeated again. So Lord, I pray that our focus would be on Christ. Our focus would be on you. Our focus would be on the word of God. Our focus would be reaching people with the truth. Help us to stay away from these things that can have an influence on our lives, on our children's lives, and even in our, our homes, you have churches, our communities. Father, there is a lot of this stuff going on and it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. As the word of God says, demonology is becoming very apparent. So Lord, I pray that you protect us, you watch over us, that you give us the, the grace to live for you. Father, please bless your people here tonight as only you can. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.